We're going on to the next part now. We're going to look at what uh, is called dry friction. We've done some of that, of course, in Physics 1. Uh, we're going to do some more now as we, uh, as we go through this. By dry friction, we mean exactly what it might sound in that there's no liquid or gaseous layer uh, that's meant to lubricate the two surfaces that are in contact. Uh, probably more specifically, it also means too that the two surfaces in contact are solids, that we're not looking at two fluids in contact and the friction between those two fluids. That's more a fluid mechanics question. Um, so uh, we're just looking at the straight dry friction uh, between two uh, surfaces. Uh, not necessarily guaranteeing that they're clean um, of all maybe contaminants or residue that might affect the friction. If there was that kind of thing, that's going to affect uh, the coefficients that, that are coming up again, if you remember. Um, so we're, we're just keeping things pretty much straight as is. All right, so just a, a little bit in reminder for us. If we've got an object of some weight sitting on a tabletop or some other solid surface, and this being a class of uh, strict adherence to the condition of static equilibrium, we know that there must be another force on that to balance the weight, otherwise it wouldn't be in equilibrium. And that force, of course, is the normal force. The fact that the object, gravity is actually trying to pull the object through the table, but the tabletop has its, uh, it has molecular integrity, if you will. It's, it's not prone to just flying apart and letting things pass through it. Yeah, we could put something heavy enough on it to actually crush a table, but all that's good for is a video on Tosh.0, so that's no, that's no good to us. So we know, we know that we have the condition of static equilibrium because of this uh, effort by the material uh, of the tabletop itself to stay together is actually pushing back on the, on the, uh, the weight itself. Now, for that example, it's instantly uh, obvious the magnitude of the normal force. I hope. Equal to the weight. However, uh, I caution you, that's only occasionally true, that the normal force equals the weight. In fact, the only times it's true is when the surface upon which the object rests is perpendicular to the direction of gravity and the only force on the object itself is its own weight. Only then is weight equal to normal in magnitude. Any other time, if there's any other force in the problem, then it's quite likely that the normal force will not be equal to the weight, so you have to be careful. Uh, especially any other force that contributes in the vertical direction. Also remember the normal force is always perpendicular to the two surfaces in contact. In fact, that's what the normal, the word normal means in science and engineering. It means perpendicular, and it usually means perpendicular to a surface. And that's exactly the condition we've got here. All right, so that's, that's always there as part of these problems. Now we're going to make the attempt in a very simple way of moving this object by pushing on it. And we'll keep it simple to start with. We'll just push on it with a horizontal force to try to slide it across whatever surface that is for whatever reason we want to do this. And that force is uh, applied at some height h, which is important to us. It's important to our problems 
what that height h is in terms of maintaining our condition of static equilibrium. Now that we're trying to push it across the floor, of course, friction is resisting that and will push back. In this class, it's always going to be true that we're in static equilibrium, so the force is always balanced. So in this case, we know that P must equal F. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in equilibrium. That goes with the uh, condition of the normal force we had here of W equals N. In this case, in any other case, W won't equal n, not any any other case, but many other cases, w and n will not be equal in magnitude. But you may have noticed, I haven't bothered to put the normal force up there yet. That's because something happens with that uh, that may not be terribly obvious, and a fact we also skipped in Physics 1, and that's that if the normal force acts right in the middle there, right through the weight like it did when it was just sitting here, what then is the problem with, the, with it? I'll put it in here for now, but it's going to come out because this isn't right. What's the problem with this in terms of our condition of static equilibrium at all times? If you take the moment about the point that they all go through, it's not in you take the moment about any point and we can't get the moments to sum to zero. We have uh, two forces, equal and opposite in magnitude, separated by a distance. What's that called? That's a couple. We have a couple. We have one couple between P and F and we have nothing opposing that. So we know that the normal force must actually shift a little bit in position. Which way? We have this couple trying to turn things clockwise. The normal weight couple must try to turn things counterclockwise. So the normal force must shift up here somewhere. Its magnitude is the same. What that means is the normal force, the, the pressure on the object is just going towards that front corner a little bit, which kind of makes sense. Uh, if you especially imagine you're pushing a box on real thick carpet, maybe orange shade carpet, like, uh, like I had in my apartment when I was in college, uh, if you're pushing on something, it's going to kind of dig into the carpet there at the front because the normal force is shifting as, as that couple is applied between the force and the weight. And so we have the, this is actually the sum of the forces in the y direction. This is the sum of the forces in the x direction. And we also have to have a moment balance between the two. So we know that uh, the magnitude, oh, let's, let's give this a little distance. We'll just call it x. But that's a darn good horizontal variable for us. We know that n times x must equal p times h. Or w times x equals f times h, or whichever, because the, those are couples and the magnitudes are, are the same. Now, that's important to us to pay attention to. Because if x is greater than or equal to one half the width, what happens? Well, let's see. Where is one half, if x equals one half the width? Well, oh, that's when the normal force gets right out to this corner. And what happens then 
if the normal force gets all the way out to the corner and you're still pushing on it up here, the object's going to tip over. And you, you, you can go verify that for yourself. Uh, your, your, your mom has this, that, uh, her grandmother's uh, china cabinet. Was on, so you can go push on it and knock it over if the normal force gets to the side. And she won't mind at all because she knows it's an experiment for class. Um, uh, if she's angry, just have her call the president and talk to him about our educational methods and you'll, you'll get off trouble. All right, so if, if that happens, then of course the object will uh, will tip. All right, so the, the deal, as you probably remember, is that as the applied force goes up, that's our force P along there, that's you pushing on the thing, as that goes up, now, for most of you, of course, that won't go up very far. But for me, that could go way up there. Way up there could go, it could go way. And there's not a graph big enough to, to put me on. So uh, as that force goes up, of course, the friction force responds to that. For a while, the friction force, in fact, is exactly the same size as the force you're applying, but the object's not moving. And that starts from uh, very low forces and goes all the way up. There's a one-for-one -one correspondence while the object's not moving, as there must be, otherwise we won't have static equilibrium. If it's just sitting there and you're pushing on it, then for us to have static equilibrium, it has to remain sitting there. Because if it stops sitting there, and then it accelerates. And of course, we know that as the, the static region where nothing's moving yet. It's not tipping, nor is it sliding. Because we're in a static equilibrium at all times. But as you know, it does reach a maximum. Oh, and, uh, on on uh, similar axes, which by that I mean these are both force axes, but if they're both actually even spaced uh, the same as each other, that numerical spacing along the two axes are the same, this is of course a 45 degree angle. Uh, if the spacing isn't the same, then certainly the slope is still one. It just wouldn't be a 45 degree angle because you've distorted it just with the graphing, but uh, this is always a one-to-one -one slope. Um, that's our condition of static equilibrium at all times. And then at some point, it finally breaks loose and then is essentially constant after that, if the force continues to grow. And that then is our kinetic region of uh, friction, where the two surfaces are moving over each other. And that's all we look at now. Sometimes it's easy for students to get distracted and think, what's the object doing? Is it moving or is it not moving? And that's not at all the point here. The point is whether the surfaces are moving relative to each other. Is one sliding over the other? If so, we're in the kinetic region. If it's, they're not sliding over each other, then we're in the static region. And what's actually going on is in the uh, static region, the two surfaces, which are pretty irregular, are, are well sitting into each other. So there's there's a lot of points where they drag over each other, a lot of points where uh, things are rubbing in or caught on each other. All, and that's why the static friction can go up so high. Finally, the surfaces start to move, and now these same two very rough surfaces 
now they they they're kind of skipping uh, uh, from peak to peak as they skip over. They don't settle in and really grip on each other. They're sort of dancing across the the tops of the peaks, and that's why the kinetic friction tends to drop. There's some other things going on in there, but the far and away the biggest part of it all is just simply that. And that's why rougher surfaces have greater friction too. There's just more places for those things to dig in. And smoother surfaces uh, tend to have much less friction. There's just a lot less place for these things to dig in. Alright, so uh, experimentally, and that's important that this, this stuff that follows can only be determined through experiment. There's no way that you can start from first principles. There's no way you can start from F equals MA and derive any of this stuff. Experimentally, it's shown that the ratio of that maximum force to the normal force, not the weight, because the weight doesn't really change in a problem, but we can do all kinds of things to change the normal force. One of the easiest things to do is just to change the direction of the force we're applying, and that'll change the normal force that alone. Experimentally, it's shown that for the most part that uh, F max ratio with the normal force is a constant. For two particular surfaces. If you change the surfaces, you get a different constant. Or two particular surfaces. If you have uh, uh, metal on wood, because you're trying to see how badly you can gouge the hardwood floors at home by sliding something over them, a big metal crate. Uh, that will have a very different constant <coughs> ratio between these two things uh, than will uh, any other surfaces. Rubber on concrete, rubber on asphalt, very important to us, uh, especially if we ever get out on our bicycles again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that constant then you know as the static coefficient of friction. Very approximate, it's pretty hard to do these experiments over and over and over again and keep getting the same number, uh, especially over in a physics lab where people are always touching the surfaces, getting their greasy hands all over them, you know, with the stuff you guys eat in there. There's grease all over the place. There's chalk dust everywhere. Um, so these are very approximate values, but they're also available uh, in those approximate values. And table D1 in the book, uh, page, I don't know what page, page something or other. Well, that's I wrote down yesterday. Oh, it's page 499. For those of you who can't find D1 by going and looking at what happens after Appendix C. Uh, now you can just go by page number. But there it is. Uh, this, again, very approximate. Well, not very approximate. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty well known. But... Uh, if you're using it for design purposes, you want to pick the more conservative value, which means uh, you know if you're designing for things where you need certain friction, maybe between car tires and, and road surface, you want to design for the smaller values of those so that anything above that is just safety. Uh, also a little bit affected by area, but not terribly, not enough for us to even put this into it. Which is interesting because if you talk to most people, they'll say that the contact area is very important. Um, 
you don't see race cars anymore with the little skinny tires they used to have. They got big, fat, wide tires now. Um, that's because it does have some effect. It does increase friction somewhat, but uh, they've already pushed this to the limit as far as they can. The area is the next place they can go with it. All right, so we know then, uh, uh, since the static friction that we experience is a maximum there that we can then say that the static friction is always going to be less than or equal to that limit, that static friction limit at the very top of things that we got there. And once we get out into this kinetic region where things are moving smoothly over each other, we have the same kind of thing that the kinetic friction is uh, essentially a constant in ratio with the normal force. A different constant, there's a different coefficient of friction. And for the most part, it's constant. The, the kinetic friction, once things start slipping, uh, things are, are pretty constant. And so your experience trying to move something across the floor, you start to push on it a little bit, it's not moving, so you push on it more and more and more and more until it finally starts moving, starts slipping, but you don't want to keep accelerating, so what you do usually is you back your force off to some other lower level that's just equal to this, which would actually put you back here. So you, your, your applied force will back up to here, just so the kinetic friction and your applied friction balance and it no longer accelerates. Um, most of you would want to get something moving, just want to get it moving. You don't want it to keep going faster and faster and faster until you're sprinting in it. Um, down the stairs, across the street, through the neighbor's yard. I don't think you want to do that. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about the uh, conditions. Uh, we we always have static equilibrium in our problems as we go through these things. That's always the condition for this class. Dynamics, which you guys have refused to take because. I don't know, you're not smart enough or something. <laughs> we then uh, could keep increasing the force that we apply, even though the force of friction doesn't increase, so we could make these things accelerate if we wanted to. All right, so we're at some kind of condition like this at some particular time. We're pushing on an object of a particular weight. And friction is pushing back, and the normal force has shifted a little bit. <clears throat> and so we've got that, that general setup there. And we then have a reaction force. between the friction and the normal force that's like that. And that's just like any other reaction we had. Due to the loads imposed, then the supporting structure applies forces such that the object itself remains in equilibrium. This angle here, we call phi. It's the angle between the normal and the reaction. Typically when we look at angles of import, we do look at the angle between the normal and the force we're talking about. That also has a limit to it because once we get to the maximum friction, since the normal force is a constant, 
we can get to a maximum point uh, of static friction, uh, the static angle, static friction angle. And if you look at the little picture, you'll see that's the uh, arc tangent of the friction force over the normal force. And if we're talking about the maximum, then that gives us a maximum possible angle of the reaction with the friction and the normal force uh, due to contact with that supporting surface. And that uh, ratio, F max to N, we know as the static coefficient of friction. So there's a maximum angle uh, to which these, these uh, pieces can go. And in this case, it's the static friction that's causing that reaction to be at some angle. And so that's, that's a pretty well-known well number, too, since the coefficients of friction are, for the most part, pretty well-known. And then the very same thing for the kinetic friction. If the surfaces happen to be sliding over each other, also equal to the uh, inverse tangent of the uh, coefficient of kinetic friction. And so that angle is the angle of kinetic friction. And we can use that sometimes in our, uh, in our design points. Typically, these coefficients of friction Uh, what can I put? Is that, is that uh, less than and s about equal to 1? There, there are some that are greater than 1 by a little bit. What? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm asking you, does it make sense? Enough to use? Okay. If it's not made up, it should have been by now. Because we need it. This isn't the first time it's ever been needed. There are some coefficients of friction greater than one. What this means is that the friction can actually be greater than the normal force. It doesn't mean the friction being greater than the applied force. That would be a bit spooky if you pushed on something and the friction was greater than that and you start accelerating backwards. <laughs> that would be, that, that, yeah, we don't, I don't, that's scary. Uh, uh, I guess cast iron on cast iron can have a very, very high coefficient of friction. Um, probably has to do with a lot of molecular stuff then going on, that being uh, the two similar uh, materials. Um, and you know, if, if you have any brains at all, you've used this to your advantage, a uh, very high coefficient of friction before, by offering to clean the glasses and after you can do this at thanks no do it before Thanksgiving do it this weekend offer to wash the glasses for your mom then you put two round glasses inside each other and put them in the cabinet and then the only way to get them apart is to actually break one of the glasses and your mom will say you're never doing the dishes again and you go oh mom I really wanted to help with Thanksgiving cleanup but the fact I was gonna do the whole cleanup myself but I won't now, and I'll go smoke cigarettes with Uncle Earl and watch the football games. Darn it. Have another Bud Light. All right, so that's, 
That's the deal going on there with these things. Now, there are, uh, there are three types of problems that we're going to come across. Not really in any particular order, other than this is kind of how they make sense. Uh, maybe an increasing uh, difficulty, I guess. Uh, type 1 uh, problem, we're right at the point of impending motion. If you're ever told in a problem, what's the minimum force necessary to get an object moving, then it's this type of problem. You're right at the point of impending motion. You know that any greater force applied is going to make the thing start to slide, and so you now then have motion. And by motion, we're always talking, remember, about the two surfaces relative to each other, not the object itself. Usually it's the object as well because the other surface is stationary. But if we're, we could look at, uh, at two objects, uh, neither of which really move, but they could still have their surfaces sliding over each other. Uh, you know, some kind of uh, 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 rollers or something that might uh, be trying to get something to move. So if we're at the point of impending motion, then we know that we're right at this maximum friction and we can then use that in our static balance for the uh, problems we do. And it's a, a relatively straightforward problem to solve. There may be a bunch of angles in the problem that make it a little harder, but the forces are fairly easy uh, if we've got that situation. The second category is that we do have relative motion of the two surfaces. In other words, one is sliding over the other. I don't care which object is moving or not. It may be part of the problem. But in terms of the friction, all we care about is that the two surfaces are in motion relative to each other. If that's the case, then again, we know the friction and we just put it in the problem. The third category, I need a little bit more room for this just because it, it is a bit more involved, this one. It's that we don't know whether we're in category one or two. Which is why we need a third one. So unknown if it's one or two. So we need to adapt some, uh, adopt some kind of strategy to, uh, to work on the problem. So uh, what we do is we assume that we're in a condition with the friction of static equilibrium. In other words, assume that the friction force is at its maximum. We're right at the point of impending motion. Once we've done that, then we can uh, use our static equilibrium equation, sum of the forces, sum of the moments, anything else we need to do. Um, and we can solve for the, the friction force required to maintain that static equilibrium. And we'll go through a problem that, to show just like uh, just what we're talking about. If the 
force required is less than the maximum force available, then you know that you're in this uh, you're in a, a, a static equilibrium condition and everything's fine. Your assumption was good. Um, let me uh, let me clarify a little. We, you don't necessarily actually put this assumption in. Uh, you just assume the object is in static equilibrium and that it couldn't be anything more than the max, but then you have to find out what it is to see where, where it comes in. If uh, F required in the problem is actually equal to that X max, then you know you've got a, uh, a type 1 problem. assumption of static equilibrium doesn't hold. And you must be then in a kinetic friction and you now have a type 2 problem. So let's step through that and see what I mean. Okay, so far? All right, so again, late Saturday night, you've done some stuff you're embarrassed of and you have to clean up and move this stuff out of the house before the folks get home. So you have 250 pounds of plastic cups, KFC buckets. Um, what else do you guys have at your parties? Kegs. Kegs. <laughs> a couple of kegs. No, but you don't throw those out. You take those back for the deposit. Yeah. 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 Ball. I, I mean, I do. <laughs> what? Ping pong balls. Ping. Oh my goodness, I can only guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, you're going to push on it at midpoint, just to be convenient for this problem. So it's a big box. So there's you, P for pushing. What? Would you get one of the guys to do it? Sure. You're passed out on the couch. <laughs> All right. The box is two feet by three feet. So you're pushing halfway up there. Uh, what about, oh, the push is 90 pounds. Can you guys manage that? Well, you can call uh, Fiona for help. She'll help you out. So what else we got? All right. Yeah, see, you admit it. I tricked you into admitting it. We'll assume uniform density, which puts the weight right at the centroid of the area. And then, of course, we know now that because of the imbalance between the moments caused, the couples, that there will be some distance unknown. where the normal force is acting. Because there's always a possibility this push is going to cause the thing to tip over. All right, 
And this problem, it's not clear if it's a one or a two just because you haven't been told anything. You haven't been asked for the minimum force. You've been given a force. Uh, oh, coefficient of friction, you have to have that too, 35. That's the coefficient of static friction. Uh, because that's where we need to test our limit first. We need to see, see where we are in that. All right, so we don't know what we've got. We don't know if we're going to, this force is going to be enough to make it start sliding or if it's enough to make it uh, stay still. So we'll assume static equilibrium. That's nothing more than saying the x forces will sum to zero. Uh, only x forces because that's the direction of possible motion. Uh, we're assuming this is sitting on a flat surface uh, because of the way the normal force was drawn. So, oh, oops, sorry. Got to, uh, got to, got to change things up here a little bit. Sorry about that. We'll uh, put a little bit of a cant to the uh, the force there. Good thing you're. Doing it in pencil, yeah, there we go. Oh, look at everybody erase all of a sudden. What a flurry of activity. Everybody, oh no, Dana's in pen. Oh, uh, no. oh no, but he, he, did, he just used the arrow then as the, uh, as the, uh, the uh, uh, whatever datum level there. So we'll call that 30 degrees. There we go. All right, so we'll assume static equilibrium, which is nothing more than saying so, which means the x forces must equal the y forces, or must equal each other. So p cosine 30, and we've got p and cosine 30, oh, you can look it up, must equal f So we know that the friction force for static equilibrium, with that force being applied, we can actually find out must be 77.9 uh, pounds. That must be less than F max. Otherwise, our assumption doesn't hold. So, if our assumption is good, then that must be less than F max. So, what we need to do is figure out what F max is, and we can only do that if we know what the normal force is. Because F max equals the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So the normal force must be equal to any forces down. W plus P sine 30. And that comes out to be 295 pounds, because we have all those numbers. Notice the normal force doesn't equal the weight. You assume that right off the bat, you're just being lazy. And I will get you. Now we can figure out what F max is and double check that we're under it. We know the static coefficient of friction, 0.35. We know the normal force now, 295. And so we get a uh, value of 130. And you draw what conclusion from that? Assumption was good. 
the friction force required to keep this in the static equilibrium we assumed was 78 pounds. There's a maximum of 103 available, so we're under that. So you're not pushing hard enough yet to make it start to move. And in fact, from that, you can figure out how far you need to, uh, to push it uh, so it starts to move. What? Is it 103 bigger than 39? So it's not, so max yeah. is not less than that? Yeah, 78 is less than 103, so the assumption is good. Oh, okay. Would it help if I did this in French? You'd drive Fiona nuts, but would it help you? <laughs> All right. Uh, are we done with the check for static equilibrium? No. Why not? Yeah, it's still possible that this thing could tip. It might not slide. Well, we know it won't slide, but it still could tip, and so we need to check that. You need to sum the moments about some point. It doesn't matter which point. So uh, maybe, I don't know, it's easy to, to just pick this point right here. Just because all of the distances are, are easily known. What we're trying to check now is to make sure that X is not greater than one and a half feet. If so, then the normal force has moved off of the crate, which is impossible. Uh, it just means it's going to tip before then. So you do that. You do that part. In fact, that can be a get out of class question. If you do it in two minutes, you'll start your weekend early. To sum the moments about point O, you can do it any other point, but uh, that's a pretty easy one. We know all the forces, so you might as well do it where the, the distances are most easily known. this angle. If that angle is 30, then yeah, yeah I guess yeah, you're right. because alternate interior angle, that's going to be 30. This is going to be 60. To complete that, the other one has to be 30. Well, no, this could be 30. I guess it could be 30, but it's got to, here's what we need to check then is, is let's see, this is, this is 60. Yep. If that's one and that's 60, is this one and a half? Is it? Yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, so that means that the tangent of 60 is the side opposite over the side adjacent. Is that true? Just check. 
check your calculator. 10 and 60, one and a half. How hard is 10 and 60? Is it one and a half? <laughs> no? Then, then, does, then that force does not go through that point. These angles, that might be a 30 degree angle, and that is, that doesn't mean it goes through that point. Because that, that's going to make a 30 degree angle with any point along there. Why is that the one that makes it work? Because it looks like it on the board. Because <laughs> it'll look like it on the board, so be careful. So, um, probably best to make. that into the two components because each of those contribute moment and those are easy to figure out their moment arms because of the distances. Alright, gotta go, you're ruining my weekend, you're ruining your weekend. You should get an x equal to point zero three five. Which means it will or will not tip? Uh, not tip. Will not.